Good evening. I am Sophronia Scott, director of the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing, and welcome to Fiction and the MFA. This is a virtual open house and a sample lesson from one of our fabulous faculty to give you a taste of some of the learning that we have available for you in our tremendous graduate program. I'm going to, uh, you're absolutely welcome, Lori. <laughs> I am going to uh, share my screen and tell you a little bit about the program. And then I'm going to hand it over to Karen. I will introduce Karen and she will lead your lesson. So let me hit that share. Okay, so here we are. So the Alma College MFA is a low residency program. And, and by the way, I'm excited to do this presentation with actual pictures of students. So <laughs> the images you see are from our first residency, which happened just this past June, uh, and we're totally excited about it. The Alma MFA is a two-year degree, and it is a low residency degree. And if you don't know what that means, that means that you are not on campus full time. You do not have to leave your job, uh, move, uh, uh, you know, leave your home. This is uh, where you only have to show up on campus twice a year for two 10 day residencies. During that residency, you attend workshops, you listen to lect attend lectures, and you get paired up one on one with a faculty mentor with whom you develop a study plan for the rest of the semester. Karen, will you keep admitting people for yeah. me? Yeah. 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 Got it. <laughs> So, um, so that study plan will involve a reading list, a very detailed reading list, and a schedule of <coughs> creative and critical work that you will submit once a month for the next five months. And for many writers, it's a tremendous way of working because it mirrors real life. So with a traditional MFA, you would be going outside of your life to focus solely on writing, but then you have to go back to your life when the program is over and figure out how you're going to keep working. In this program, you are working as you would usually, getting your writing in while you're still going to your job, while you're attending to family matters, uh, which is the real writing life. Upon graduation, a successful MFA student will demonstrate a proficiency of writing skills, strong organization and structure, uh, and adept use of language, communication. I like to say that you will have an understanding of your magic. You know, I, uh, when I went to get an MFA, people used to say to me, well, why are you doing that? You are already published because I had already published a novel. And I explained to them that, that yes, I, I basically figured out how to write that novel myself but I didn't understand what made it good. It felt like a airplane I built in my garage and, and yes, it flew, but I felt that if I had some understanding of language and craft and, and, and a language for what I was doing, that I would be able to build a rocket ship, that my writing would just simply take off. And I feel that has been the, the case for me. So, I'm going to introduce you to one of our fabulous faculty mentors, uh, Karen Bender, and she is the author of two story collections, Refund, which was a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction, shortlisted for the 2015 Frank O'Connor International Story Prize, and also longlisted for the Story Prize. Her collection, The New Order, was longlisted for the Story Prize in 2018. She is the author of two novels, Like Normal People, which was a Washington Post Book of the Year and a Los Angeles Times bestseller, and A Town of Empty Rooms. Her fiction has appeared in magazines including The New Yorker, Granta, Plowshares, The Yale Review, The Harvard Review, and has been reprinted in Best American Short Stories and other uh, prestigious collections. She's the winner of three Pushcart Prizes, and her work has been read at Selected Shorts at Symphony Space by Joanne Woodward and by LeVar Burton on LeVar Burton Reads. She has received grants from the Rona Jaffe Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. The visiting distinguished professor of creative writing at Holland University, she has also taught in the creative writing programs at the University of North Carolina Wilmington, the University of Iowa, and at the low residency MFA programs at Warren Wilson, 
Chatham in Antioch. And I'm excited. Oh, and she is the fiction editor of the literary journal Scoundrel Time. And I'm pleased that she is with us. So thank you, Karen, I'm going to stop the share. And, uh, and I'll also monitor the, the chat for you. Well, oh, great. Yeah, thank you, Sophronia. I am so happy to be part of the ALMA MFA program. Uh, Sophronia has put together an amazing program with wonderful faculty and students. And I, we had our first residency and it's just really a special place. So, um, so I wanted to just give you a little taste of kind of how I teach writing. I feel like as a, as a, as a writing teacher, my goal is to help you kind of find your way you want to see the world. Um, and also uh, kind of, I have like three pillars that I think create a good writer. One is honesty, that the best writing is honest, um, that it is, you know, not what we're supposed to think, but what we really think, you know, how we really see the world. Um, I think the world is full of so many lies to actually see things in the way that you know are true is really a, a revolutionary act, you know? So I think honesty is first and it's also bond between people, you know, because we don't necessarily know what it is like to be another person except fiction is I think, or nonfiction or, or poetry are the closest we get to that. So, um, so then the next thing is craft. Um, we learn uh, elements of craft, sensory detail, plot, scene, um, you know, all different ways, voice, perspective, all these different ways that you can tell a story, all the tools you need to tell your story. And the last thing is patience, revision. How do you get your work to be better? How do you get it in shape to be published? How, and it really is just sticking with it and being patient and, and through the vision process, through, um, it's true. Monica says revision requires so much. Faith. It is so true. <laughs> it is all. Yeah, I really feel like that is the key to being a writer. Like stubbornness and patience are really almost all of it, and also knowing some things about craft. So, um, so those are my those are my things. I want to just quickly go around and just see who's here. Just say your name and where you are. I'm just really curious uh, where everyone is from. So let's see. I see Monica. Monica, where are you? Hi, I'm Monica. I'm in I'm in the state of Washington, not too far from Seattle. Oh, awesome. Hi, welcome. Thanks. Let's see. Uh, Christina Marie, where are you? Hi, I'm I'm in the um, Three Fires land. I'm on Ojibwa land um, and in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So I'm very close to Alma. Alma. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see. I can't really... Rimna? Uh, uh, yeah, Rima. Uh, Rima. I'm currently in Alma. <laughs> Oh, you're Alma. Okay, awesome. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, Lori. Sorry, I was muted. Well, right now I'm sitting in my cousin's apartment in Studio City in Los oh, Angeles, awesome. but I just flew in from Durham, North Carolina, where I live most of the time. Oh, wonderful. Great. And Sophronia and I have spoken on the phone before. Oh, so cool. I'm excited to be here. And I love your writing, so... Oh, very oh, excited okay. to get the invitation. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. And Rosa. Yes, good evening. I'm in Saginaw. Great. And uh, I've, I've also explored the website and your work and uh, the director's work. And I thank her for all her patience <laughs> and her blessings. I needed them. I had foot surgery, so I missed my deadline. Yeah, so I'm back on my feet, figuratively and literally. So I'm so glad to hear wh what's going on with Alma. I'm an hour away, oh, as you great. know, just straight down the freeway awesome. from Alma. Yeah, Karen, what, what Rosa means is that, that Rosa was uh, trying to join us for the summer residency. Oh, oh, well, so, yeah. next one. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, Thank you. Good. Well, so welcome to all. So, so what I'm going to do today is we're going to, I, I would send some materials out and um, this is just like a little mini craft workshop um, focusing on sensory detail. Um, so I feel like the best writing is specific writing. I mean, that's what makes, um, that's, that's kind of how we first experience the world, you know, I like to view it as, as the way the world is sticky, you know, to you. Um, you know, we're born and we don't have language yet. You know, we just, we experience the world through sights, you know, smell, sound, hearing, you know, touch. And um, 
And so when you can evoke those things as a writer, I think it really can be a way of bringing the reader in and seeing, you know, you know, a snow your way or seeing a highway or, you know, whatever it is, um, that will kind of bring the reader into your world. Um, I have uh, my daughter who's now, she's actually now a wonderful poet. And um, when she was a little girl, she uh, we went to J. Crew, you know, the, the store and we were looking for clothes and she was going around and she sort of was, was smelling. And she said, it smells like old hot dogs. And I was like, it does. And it was sort of odd because it wasn't the smell you think about when you go into J. Crew, <laughs> you know, which is this fancy store. And so it was like, yeah, she was aware. She wasn't sort of thinking it would be a particular smell, she smelled the old hot dog. So I think finding ways to let yourself see the world as you see it, you know, is really what you, your job as a writer. Um, so what I wanna do is go over one of my favorite writers, John Cheever, who is just one of my writing gods. Um, I really learned how to write stories through reading his collected stories. Um, and let me do a share screen. We're just gonna go over, um, so close reading is what helps one become a writer too, is when you know, your teachers are really writers and you read them and you think, how did they create this magic? And part of what I like to do as a teacher is kind of show you what I think a writer has done, you know? And so we can kind of learn to imitate them, <laughs> you know, or do what they're doing in our own ways. So, um, okay, let me do share screen. City of Broken Dreams. Okay. All right. So, O City of Broken Dreams. I don't know if anyone had a chance to, to take a look at it, but it's basically the story of um, the uh, ever the Malloys. Uh, this is in I think it was written like the 1950s, 40s, 50s. Um, Cheever wrote a lot about New York and Westchester. Um, you know, at kind of at that time. Um, and he, he really, he, he was very focused on looking at class and status and um, family in really interesting, really precise ways. So basically the Malloys are coming. Um, Everett's Malloy was told that he could maybe sell his play to Broadway. And so they basically like just get on the, you know, they get on the train and go to New York, <laughs> you know, hoping this will happen. So, um, and they're kind of, they're kind of naive, you know? And so what happens is they're, you know, he's describing the characters, you know, they're talking and then they get out of the train at Grand Central Station. And then we have some really amazing sensory details. Um, so we have, as the Malloy stepped from the train, Alice noticed the paving deep in the station had a frosty glitter. And she wondered if diamonds had been ground into concrete. I mean, this is my favorite lines ever. Because I feel like, what do you learn about Alice from this description? Diamonds have been ground into the concrete. Any thoughts? You can just, uh, I can't see all of you on the thing here. So you could just like speak if you want. I was just, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just had put in the chat that she's so naive and you see her naivety in action. Uh-huh, right. Oh, I didn't look in the chat. Let me look in the chat. Um, she's very naive. Yes, very true. Um, she has a wild, vivid imagination. Very true. Yes, these are great points. And then you look at specific words. Like in a way, she knows the paving had a frosty glitter. Like, you know, like Cheever is letting her notice like the pavement, it's not just like concrete, it has a frosty glitter. She wanted diamonds. So what, what associations do you have with diamonds? If you are someone that's like more adult and also likes maybe the finer things. Okay, uh-huh, she's interested. Yeah, she's hoping, she's hoping, you know, the diamonds are there. Good. She's a dreamer, probably young and naive. Uh huh. Yeah, she's attentive. And also, I do that diamonds are val. You know, they're associated kind of with value. Okay. So you have like diamonds are in the concrete. She's thinking this place is just like there's there's value everywhere. She's but and she also knows nothing. Like they're not. You know. <laughs> and so she's kind of idealizing it. Um, 
They wandered through the marble waiting room, following the noise of traffic and klaxons as if it were the bidding of life. You know, what feeling do you get from that? It creates a kind of feeling. Um, it's just like the bidding of life. I mean, it's just like, it feels really big. Um, Let's see, uh, the, the faces that pass them seem purposeful and intent as if they all belong to people who are pursuing the destinies of great industries. Like everyone seems like they're doing something really important. Um, and then they get into the hotel Mentone, which they had found because they saw it on a billboard. <laughs> so, they, so they have this great description. It was on a side street west of Sixth Avenue. It was a dark place with malodorous chambers, miserable food and a lobby ceiling decorated as much guilt and gesso as the Vatican chapels. So what do you get from that line about the Hotel Mentone? Like it's, like it's glittery, like it feels like it's, you know, there's something sort of fancy about it, like the Vatican, it, it makes, it's almost holy, except it has malodorous chambers and it's, it's kind of dark, you know, so it's like, you know, it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's smelly, you know, and then, you know, so, so it feels like something isn't quite right in this hotel. Yeah. And then she goes, the windows looked onto a brick wall, but when she raised it, she could hear the noise of traffic and it sounded as it sounded in the station, like the, oops, let me move this over a little bit. Um, like the irresistible and titanic voice of life itself. So when you say, you know, the, it, the sound of the city sounds like the titanic voice of life itself, what feeling do you get from that? Yeah. Um, let's see, is it Christy? Yeah. Oh, ask to mute. Um, oh, no. You, you can, oh, let's see, ask to mute. Okay. How come you're not on mute? Sorry about that. I don't know. I double clicked. Okay. I'm, okay, got yeah, it. I was going to say, um, I didn't get this at first reading, but now that you have read it aloud, I feel like there's this foreshadowing of all of the tawdry events that are going to befall <laughs> this family. Just right. from the hotel description, which is really interesting because yes. you wouldn't think a place description could have this time. It's like a clicking of a clock like an alarm is going to go off and things are going to go down uh, badly yeah, exactly he's creating a feeling through the setting you know like you have this ominous feeling like things are really kind of beautiful and great and fancy and they're also kind of scary underneath um let's see uh they, yeah they lack sophistication there's a larger than life worldliness that dwarfs them yes great absolutely um, it's out of their league. Good. I love the use of the Titanic. Yes. The use of the word Titanic is really good. So I think one thing to do when you're reading is you look at what choices, what word choices writers make. They make such a difference. You know, um, I'm just going to go really quickly to um, this office where they have, you know, all these people, um, you know, are kind of fooling the Malloys. And then he goes to the office of this agent the the Hauser agency um and then we have this I think really great description of this of this office um at the end of a long corridor there was a pair of bronze doors fastened by a bifurcated eagle you know an eagle it's not like a pigeon it's not like a small handle it's an eagle it feels like really grand right Everett's turned the wings that Imperial Burton stepped into the lofty manor hall. The paneling on the walls was worm pitted and white with rot. So suddenly, oh no, you know, it's not so grand. Um, in the distance behind a small glass window, he saw a wo woman wearing earphones. Um, he's asked to sit down. Um, he sat on a leather sofa and lighted a cigarette. Then he noticed the sofas covered in dust. So the table, the magazine on it, the lamp, the bronze cast of Rodin's Le Bazaire, everything in the vast room was covered with dust. So the dust and, you know, and then you have the eagle, what feeling do you get from the office from that description? <laughs> I 
it's like no one's there, right? No one cleans. It's like dead, right? It's just like, you know. So basically, um, through just a couple little details, he creates a feeling of like it's supposed to be grand. It's supposed to be, you know, this place, it's bronze, you know. But then he goes in and it's like rotting. And then there's, you know, the magazines are five years old. Um, it gives this ominous feeling. So I'm going to stop sharing the story. Um, just and um, oh hi Joy, <laughs> and Joy is one of our students, and um, and so uh, basically what I want you to do is do a little writing exercise because I think the way we learn to write is we read and then we respond to what we read through writing. So I want you to write a sh very short sensory detail paragraph about a place that's memorable to you. It could be some place you love. It could be some place you hate whatever it what it could be any place but you need to kind of describe it just using a sensory detail so we get a sense of it so what I'd like to do is give you 10 minutes okay is that good is that enough is Fronty and Willie have time they have 10 minutes okay so say it's 7 23 say 7 33 um what we'll what I usually do with exercises is I have people turn off their video and sound and write for 10 minutes and then turn on again and then share if you want. Um, you can either just read it, you can post it in the chat, but we can see a little bit about these places that are important to you and see how you sensory detail. Um, and then so, and then we, we could ask answer questions. But um, but uh, this is your chance to jump in and do some writing. Um, so every, is that clear to everybody? Okay. And you don't have to share if you don't want either, just a, but, but if you it's optional. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ten minutes. Uh, so I'll see you in ten minutes. I feel writing about a place using sensory detail. Was it hard? Easy? Fun? I don't know. And so I felt like I didn't get to where I wanted to go. It was. <laughs> That's always how it is. <laughs> I felt like right around the time you said it was time, I was finally getting to like. The place that I wanted to be. Yeah, so it's a little ten minutes is a little short, but um, but it's a start. It's a start. Yeah. Um, let's hear. Does anyone want to share to read or put some of it in the chat, or what do you think? <laughs> I'll read. If nobody oh, else. awesome! Thank you, Laura. Do it's you want to put it in the chat, or or you can just read if you want. Uh, I think it'd be hard to type it into the chat. Um, um, okay, so I think I'll copy and paste, but... Um, oh, I, I wrote by hand. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. So, yeah, so... At, so what are, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. No one writes by hand anymore, I guess. That's fine. That's the, the, the normal way. So, um, so what I usually have people do when they listen to writers is, is notice something that is, is working for them, something that stands out, something that's really memorable. So, um, so let's tell Laura, you know, what do you, what do you hear in the piece that's really standing out? All right. It's helpful for the writer. I, this is definitely not what I would say is a polished piece of work. So that's fine. That's fine. Right. Go for it. We drove toward the enchanted cottage as the sky turned a deep purple red on the horizon, the sun swallowed by the mountains. Um, still, oh, the sun swallowed by the mountains still lit the hills with, with gold beneath the red. We stopped talking and felt the odd evening quiet settle over the Virginia um, mm -hmm. Valley. Randy said, look, right. There we watched a band of fire shoot across a few scattered farms far beyond the narrow freeway. I was alarmed and wondered aloud if we should call 911. No, it's a controlled fire, he said. I breathed deeply and leaned back against the seat and studied the fire from afar. Randy always knew about these kinds of things. Stop, I said, that's the turn. We barely missed the sign pointing to the rural route 52. Randy spun the car on the right and curved around and shot up the dirt road, sending up a cloud of dust. The road, um, I can't read my own writing. The road wound around a few farmhouses here and there, at least one or two flying American flags and a third with both a Confederate flag and the Stars and Stripes. 
I said, well, we're still in Dixie. The night shadows began to fall across the road and the sky had gone dark except for the last pale strip of scarlet. We drove into a tunnel of dense green trees. Beautiful. Oh my gosh, there's so much there. Yeah, no, I think beautiful use of color. I love the odd even and quiet. I love that, and then you've, you know, sort of the, you get the feeling of the sky changing. Um, yeah, oh, and then Monica's, I like the sun swallowed um, by the mountains, beautiful. And also then there's that little line, like Randy usually knew what to do, or, you know, like there was this thing, like one, of, you know, that, that kind of is a hint of something that is a little off, you know? So I think that's really, you get an ominous feeling and in, in the flags, I mean, just, yeah, really a lot there. I, I wanted to add, uh, I thought I heard you use the word enchanted at the very beginning, was that right? I felt, Karen, I felt like that word set the tone for me for how I saw those colors that followed, right? Yeah. So, so it was like a certain purple, like, like sort of like storybook thing using the word enchanted. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was interesting too. Yeah, great, I wanna read more, good, thank you. Awesome. Um, anyone else want to read? Uh, Monica. Great. Uh, the asphalt was hot, but the rocks at the end of the playground offered relief. The climbing structure overlooked a busy road of cars just as anxious to reach their destination as I was to reach mine. Kids were sprawled across the playground, but like ants crowding around a hole, they surrounded the single slide, waiting their turn to go down, the only path that led them from the structure back down, 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 landing on earth. Oh, good. Oh, wow. There's a lot. There's a lot in this. Yeah, I love the hot asphalt and the cars anxious to get to their destination. And then the kids, you know, there's an ominous thing with the cars and the kids, you know, the, the kids like ants around the hole and the um, slide. So I, I, you can really see it. Really good visuals there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Um, let's see, uh, anyone else? Um, Christina. This is also, of course, rough given our 10 minute time limit, but um, <laughs> Harrison Cave. As we approach the cave, I'm filled with awareness of my own nervous energy of fluttering sense wings inside my belly. Our group is small. As we climb into the narrow metal carts, there's a tittering of laughter, a smattering of murmured conversation. Mm. We begin to roll downward, human silence pressing against us. The faint, um, I fooled around with this a lot. The faint sound of water dripping <laughs> into pools is distant and the walls of Harrison's cave emanate warmth and something else, a sense of movement. Mm. Great, oh my gosh, so much there too. I love the sound at the beginning, the, the tittering and the murmuring, and then you have the human silence pressed against us. I mean, it's beautiful. It's like silence has a weight, which is really good. And then you have the water. I think that the sounds are used really beautifully there. I liked the the repetition of the double T's, the tittering and then smattering, right? Yes, Very I nice. agree. Yeah, that, that worked really well too. Good. Yeah, you guys, this is yeah. so amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, anyone else want to share? Or, yeah, Rosa, go for it. Okay, am I unmuted? Yeah, right. yes. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, it's the story that's now become a family tale. They all had wanted to know what happened to me, surprised mm -hmm. and happy to see me alive that hot summer day, mm -hmm. fearful that they'd be picking me up my body at the morgue if they ever found it at the bottom of the lake. That's the snatch that got me going. Wow. And I, I jumped around, but from here, it's the process of dying. It's very spare writing because I, I don't want to clutter it with 
the emotion that I know will come up for you guys. Uh, so it's the process of drowning. Oh, yeah, good. And what, what that person is experiencing in, in up to where the person blacks out. Mm. And, and then the story picks up and there are feelings. There's a lot of burning in the lungs, burning in the legs, uh, trying to um, uh, uh, you know, swim up but getting the legs and feet caught in the weeds at the bottom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Meanwhile, on, on the shore, finally someone is seeing there's trouble out there splashing. Mm -hmm. Lifeguards nowhere around the post. Uh, the mother starts kneeling and praying. Then a bunch of other people are also on the shoreline kneeling and praying. Mm -hmm. The oldest sister, starts running through and, and there's emotion in, in that scene, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and they say, this is part of the story, mm -hmm. a guy, skinny, kind of wiry, muscular, uh, wearing cut off jeans, cut off plaid shirt, open, sleeveless, nondescript guy with a limp. Boom, is out there mm. before my sister. I mean, before the woman. It's, it's what happened to me <laughs> when I almost drowned. This is a young adult kind of story. Wow. I was 15, 16, it happened, I forget the lake in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I came to on the shore, I, the feeling of having to pee because I had swallowed a lot of water apparently. Wow. And I peed on the sand and all of that stuff that a young, uh, that a kid who never know. And I said, my act of contrition, I knew I was dying. I mm. said, well, yeah, people do die young, <laughs> you know? And I felt bad how my mom would feel, how people would feel my whole life went through. Um, sorry to go on. Uh, no. so, so the feelings are the kind of things that are hard to describe, but, but they, they're there, you know, for, for the okay. writer. Yeah. The point of it, though, it's, it's become a tale, a story, mm -hmm. a young adult story. And to me, the ending is what happened to that wiry man with the limp? Wow. They say with the crowd and everything, and by then the, the lifeguard was there. There was somebody in a canoe. The, the guy handed the, me the body to the people in the canoe and he kind of just disappeared in the crowd. Wow. And that's, that's what they, the witnesses tell me. I remember overnight uh, at the hospital, I lost my glasses, couldn't see. And just thinking it through what had happened. And again, I got to go back to that time frame as mm -hmm. a teen, as a tween. What, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of this? Mm. A second chance. Mm -hmm. And here I am, and I can tell it to you as an old lady. I don't know that, you know, I got to get to the, yeah. that part of the meat and the bones. If it's a young adult kind of thing, it could be a spiritual religious kind of story for uh, Reader's Digest or the angels. There's an angels publication out there. They do stories about angels. Wow. And, and so maybe uh, the tag here would be, was he my angel? Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, sorry to go on, but you know, I've been quarantining here. <laughs> and this is like my first great big, uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to share unconditionally. Oh, well, thank you. Do you want to read any of it? Or does oh, no, there... this is how I started. Because <laughs> okay. then my other track, my other brain, I was uh, 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 reliving the sticky hot nights in 1960 in Acapulco oh. when people lived or went there and didn't have air conditioning. Oh my God. In hotels. Yeah. Well, so, that, I mean, that's a different kind of story altogether. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing story. Just the way you sort of summarized it was so compelling. I mean, you've so many sensory details, just the way you yeah. shared it with the burning and the legs getting caught in the. Well, that part is so real. I, you know, I can taste it. 
yeah as they say but um i don't right. want the emotions to dominate you know what i'm saying a writer has to temper well i no. mean the thing is emotions are good i mean i think this is i, I have to kind of conditionally control it yeah but yeah. unconditionally bring it up right, right? Right. You know? Well, I think the thing is, as you know, this is the thing as writers is, you know, like we get into really powerful things, you know, as writers and that the idea is that you share it and that you learn from it. I feel like I've learned just from your description, you know, it's so moving. It's about survival, you know, and so you think about what are the stories that you want to share that are about your own survival in some way. Everyone has something, you know, That's right. That's one. That's a real basic, you know, life. Yeah, we all have these different things. So thank you. I hope you keep writing this. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And Rosa, I would recommend that uh, you go to our YouTube page and look at the video from last week with our uh, YA faculty member, uh, mentor, uh, Danielle Clayton, because okay. she has some, some great things about the immediacy of, of writing for young adult that I think would help you with, with what you're doing there. Mm. I truly do. Thank you. I will. Thank you. See, does anyone else want to read? Rina, did you want to read? <laughs> I may try, but I always feel super insecure because I started like only a few months ago. Oh, don't be insecure. Yeah, it's all, all good. Uh, it's the city that I said I would never be back to, but it's the same city which I see in my dreams every night. Every time I'm there, I take the first bus and it's always the same bus, the white number 12. As I get out of the bus, I step onto a dusty pavement and the street itself reminds me of a day when I took this bus to the college. I have heard a lot of people saying that I should see New York or Chicago, but none of the cities have ever felt as close and mesmerizing as these all streets with tiny and a bit run down houses that have never changed for the last 20 years. Looking on the left, I see the Paris community street. Probably on this balcony, a young couple fell in love 15 years ago. And on the next balcony, to eat a grainy grew lilac between us. Looking on the right, there is a sewing shop with figures of women dressed in English 18th century dresses. The same shop I passed every morning on my way to college. That was it. Oh, it's great. It's so clear. And it feels sort of eerie and almost a little bit surreal. Like, I don't, you know, there's this really nice sort of weird feeling about it. You know, I was going on the same bus. It was bus number 12. Um, I, you know, I love the description of the I love the different balconies. You know, it feels like very clear and very, um, very spare and very evocative writing. I want to know what happens in the city. Yeah, it's my hometown. <laughs> oh, interesting. It's great. Good, good. Thank you. And Joy, who is a student, do you want to? read anything joy hello <laughs> or or just hanging out <laughs> hi thank you for asking i was having a technical problem <laughs> i didn't even write mine in sentences so i'm a terrible example of a student no <laughs> <laughs> it, it's always challenging every time i do this exercise with you thank you sure it's always good to try green some of the leaves starting to turn yellow orange rust and brown there's a gazebo with enormous logs for corner posts mm. a small elliptical pond sits low and still two slight bubbling bulges mm. uh, where the fountains are a tapestry of branches and leaves painting the canvas of the sky some trunks stretch straight up some lean dangerously to the side smells like moss and faintly of smoke. It's twilight and there's a sound of the slightest breeze. Mm. I, it's a beautiful, beautiful, it's a beautiful sort of description of quiet. I love the cool, the pond, the little bulges in the pond, like, they're just like, what are those, you know? And then the, the sound of the, of the light. I mean, it just, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful kind of quietness in it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, is that everybody? I think. Um, yeah. Thank you guys all for sharing. I'm so glad you did. Um, well, so front, I guess Safran, do you have anything else you want to share, or do they? Do we ask questions or what? Well, if anyone has questions about the exercise or the learning, let's do that first. 
And if not, we'll go on to, to say a little bit more about the MFA. So first, does anyone have any questions about what Karen uh, worked on with you tonight? Monica. Yeah, I just had a question about whether in your process, like I find for like sensory and imagery and things like that, I have to go back and layer them in later. Um, like in this exercise, I was focused on it. And even then it was, it was so hard for me to do. So I'm curious if, if you find that it comes naturally to you in your first drafts, or it is something that you later go back and think through where you can add like this element to kind of um, enhance your writing. That's a great question. I think every story is different. Some of my stories come to me and they're more from a sensory place. Some come and they're from like, action, some I come from dialogue, you know, they all come from different things. And I think the idea with writing is that you can view it as like a layering process and that you may not know exactly all the things at the beginning, but like you can add sensory detail later or you can add dialogue later or, or characterization, you know. Um, but I, I actually, it's one of those things that was hard for me, I think early on. And when I started noticing it more, it became, more easy and it actually now helps me when I feel stuck. If I feel stuck, I go to the sensory and then I can get into the characters more. So it's interesting. Yeah, this is a great question. Any others? Anyone else? <laughs> okay. So I was I was going to say a couple more things about the MFA, but I didn't know that Joy was going to be with us this evening. Joy Joy is a student. I hope it's okay, Joy, that I'm going to ask you because, you know, I'm basically telling them about the program, but you can tell them what it's like to actually experience it because you are in the program right now. So how, how would you describe your experience at residency and, and the work that you're doing now? Um, well, um, it's, a, it's a process of refining um, I wasn't sure exactly where I wanted to go with it, but I'm, I have lots of opportunities to ask the many, many questions I have, and I'm being asked lots of really, really good questions that are helping uh, me to get through the chaff that seem to be uh, keeping me stuck. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm moving forward in a way that I just wasn't on my own before, mm -hmm. and it's hard to describe. I had no idea what to expect at residency, but it was a very rapid um, development of community mm. and such a constructive environment. Um, and I always feel self-conscious about the questions that I bring, but I've never had an experience that discouraged me from asking them, no matter how strange they were. Uh, so I'm really, really enjoying it. And, um, and I learned that I really don't include a lot of sensory details. So that's why I wanted to be here today. Cause I have to keep <laughs> sing it because my stories are like suspended in this nowhere place. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to anchor them in a real space, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even though there's fiction, but anyway, I mean, um, is that what you want to know? Yes, yeah. Or does anyone else have questions for, for Joy coming from the student perspective? Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to share a photograph because uh, Joy mentioned. Christina, I think, had a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Christina. I just wondered where you were in your journey. So are you one of the very first cohorts in your halfway or Joy? That's for Joy. A quarter of the way, I think. Yeah, the first cohort and a quarter of the way. And I feel like a child among adults very often, but that's in my head. No one, no one puts that on me, but I'm surrounded by very smart people and that makes me better. Um, and I had done some things with my own writing before, but I didn't know how to move further with it. And I really didn't have the structure and discipline that might have moved me further along, which I have now. Thank you. So here's, uh, Joy mentioned the, the people, the development of community. So, so here's a series of pictures from, from our first residency. And, and this is a collection of both faculty and students together. And the, the reason I show you this is because 
that that is we were so blessed to be able to be in person and our winter residency will be in person as well because the real magic of the program happens in those in-between spaces after lecture during a meal uh, this picture in the bottom left is is around a fire pit uh, in a restaurant you know uh, uh, you know during the evening where we're all just talking about writing and everyone's just excited that they're surrounded by people who know what they're talking about and who share the passion and enjoy <laughs> and enjoy uh, has, has been part of that as well. And oh my gosh, uh, Joy, I will say this too. And, and you, you realize you share interests, right? So I see Joy one day is wearing an Eagles <laughs> t-shirt. And I said to her, well, Joy, are you, are you a fan of the Eagles? because I just happened to bring with me, because I did, because I'm crazy like that, I had a DVD of the, do of the documentary of the Eagles, <laughs> the history of the Eagles. And I said, would you like to watch this with me? And so we spent a couple of evenings during residency just watching this documentary. So you, and, and other people were joining us because they talk about writing in that documentary. I find it very inspiring. So it was exciting for me to find somebody else who, who shared that and, and you know, we were able to to have you know that time, so that that's the kind of thing you don't ex you don't know what to expect, but these wonderful things happen during residency. So, uh, so to wrap up, um, I'll let you ask questions. Our application period for the winter residency is November first. If you would like to come the following summer, that deadline is May first, and what's expected. And you can find this all on the website, but I will um, put this up for you as well. Uh, the, um, the recommendations for the, not the recommendations, the uh, requirements for the application. So let's see if you can see that. Yes, there it is. Okay, so you, um, your college transcripts, so you wanna get those ordered your resume, and a creative writing sample. Now, this could be something that you've already written, or it could be something that you're working on. We're looking for promise, uh, a, a sense of potential. And this could be something that you end up workshopping uh, if you get accepted and you come to residency. A personal essay talking about your specific interest in the program, uh, what you are looking to do in the program, and what makes you feel like you're, you're in a good place to pursue this degree? What are your strengths and weaknesses as a writer? Uh, and any additional experience that you feel that you're bringing to our artistic community? The literature essay, which I feel is, is very important, basically discussing the books and writers that have influenced you, because you're gonna be reading a lot in the program. And if you're not someone who feels comfortable with that or reading is not part of your process, which it has to be if, if you want to improve your writing. Uh, we want to see that. We want to know that, that you're excited about reading. Uh, two letters of recommendation. And they don't have to be from people who know you're writing, because I know that sometimes people are writing and, and don't necessarily share it. So these can be letters that can talk about your personality, uh, how you are with organization and time management skills, how you are in community with others. Uh, let me also. Uh, because there was a question in the chat about tuition. This is the, the current tuition. Uh, it may get adjusted. I think the website talks about that uh, by next year. I'm not sure, but this is what it currently is. And again, you can see this on the website. But I also want to point out that that application for federal student um, aid opens tomorrow. That opens October 1st. So you'll want to have a look at that. I also encourage you to have someone fill out for you the refer a writer form that's on our website. And, and that's not a recommendation. That's just someone giving your name and information saying, hey, this, is a, this would be a good person for the program. And if you enter the program, you would get a $2,000 scholarship in that person's name. It, it's a really cool thing. So also, if you haven't already done so, I recommend you download uh, the decision journal, which helps you think through why you want to get an MFA. What kind of support do you need to make this happen? Why is it going to be important to you? Where do you think it's going to take your writing? 
And that's our website, alma.edu slash MFA. And this is my email address if you want to ask me more questions, Scott S at alma.edu. And that's uh, Joey and our Tricia, again, from summer residency to more students. So any questions for me? Let me chat. And, and Joy says, Joy, for you for that scholarship. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Rima, yes. I would say it's not a question. It's more of like a remark. Probably what at least for me application lacks is, for example, um, English proficiency test. As an international student, for example, like since it's the only program of like graduate school in Alma, mm -hmm. it definitely needs like test of proficiency or something because like, for example, for other undergraduate programs, these scores are pretty low. And I think it requires more and it's usually like one of the most common requirements for all the programs. So just like more of the question whether like you need it or you don't need it or if you require it, what, then what are they supposed to be scores should be? Uh, no, we don't need, um, we don't do pr the proficiency test. So you don't have to take that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take the GRE. So we're, we're mainly judging the application on the, the quality of your overall application and your writing sample. Mm -hmm. Probably it just might be confusing because like usually all the websites states like, oh, you don't need this or you don't need this. It's just like from international side. <laughs> yeah. So um, sometimes students confuse, like the way our website is set up, they confuse our website with the undergraduate menu. So the if you look at our website, there's a menu at the top, which is the main ALMA undergrad program. So. But if you go to alma.edu slash MFA and look at the second level of menus, it's the, the, the row underneath the, the, the MFA's name, then you'll see that those are our requirements. And so the, mm -hmm. so, so I just wanted to make that, that clear. Yeah, okay, got it. Thank you. <laughs> so anything else? And, and you're welcome, Monica. And yes, uh, Monica, the shame exchange rocks that's an awesome story she's talking about that's my I love that story if you haven't people read the shame exchange by karen e bender it's a short story you can google it it's online it is it's brilliant it'll blow your oh, mind so nice. how brilliant you. that story is yes oh thank you so much thank you guys all right, so is there anything else? Any other questions for this evening? Oh, oh Monica posted the <laughs> link. Click on that link. <laughs> go read that story. Sign up and go read that story. I'm serious. <laughs> All right, yes. Read oh, thank you, read. thanks Monica. All right, um, so I will wrap it up for this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank yeah, you, thank you, Karen. Karen. Thank you. Yeah. So if you need, have any other questions, please email me. I'm Sophronia Scott. She's Karen Bender. And we are with the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing. We hope to learn more about your writing and have you with us very soon. So take care. Hey, take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Writing. <laughs>